Hello, church. It's good to um, join you here in this midweek Bible study. And uh, this week I'm actually up in Florida, but uh, recording and sending it out to you guys. And we'll be back in Medida for church on Sunday. And today we're actually starting a very interesting uh, book. We're going to be looking at uh, the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah was one of the major prophets in the Old Testament. Um, Isaiah was uh, actually a prophet that prophesied for more than half a century. He was part of the, in a sense, royal family, royal. He had a royal seal, um, uh, very much involved in the, in the politics and what was going on during the time of the kingdom of Judah. If we look at our um, little chart here and see uh, where we're at, we see, we looked at Hosea, now we're Isaiah uh, is in yellow. So that means he's prophesying to Judah and Jerusalem. Remember, he's prophesying right here at the end of the time of Israel. So current events are Assyria growing in power, very soon going to destroy uh, Israel. And Isaiah is prophesying to Judah saying, if you don't <laughs> shape up, you're going to go in the same direction. You're going to have the same thing happen to you. So um, very momentous, uh, you know, times as he prophesies. Isaiah starts um, here during the, the time of Uzziah and ends in the time of Manasseh, where um, tradition tells us he was actually killed by Manasseh and he was sawn in half. So he lost his life uh, as a prophet um, during the time of Manasseh. So... Let's uh, open up and uh, see today as we look at uh, this first, uh, we're going to look at the first 12 chapters. Um, there's 66 books, so uh, there's going to take us a little bit to get through Isaiah, but we're going to take little chunks at a time. And um, the, the interesting part of Isaiah, there's kind of this correspondence, 66 chapters in Isaiah, not books, chapters, and there's 66 books in the Bible, so we had that correlation. Some people have actually tried to connect that each chapter corresponds to the, its book. For example, chapter one to Genesis, chapter two to Exodus, and so on. Uh, interesting. Uh, you can take, if you want to take time and look at each chapter and see how it would connect it. This, some things people have done. But most of this, we see the prophecies in Isaiah prophesying the coming of the Messiah. And we'll look at that today. Um, as we look at the coming of Emmanuel, God with us, he preaches the coming of the Messiah. And that is why Isaiah has that very important place about talking about the Messiah, his coming, and what the Messiah will do in the midst of a political turmoil and difficult times that Isaiah was living in. So let's uh, begin today as we open up to the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, the vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Once again, that is the focus to Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and also, of course, Manasseh. But that's where he kind of lost his life when he was killed by Manasseh. So that's one, two, three, four, and five kings that he is there um, preaching teaching, prophesying during that times. And, and in that prophecy, you know, he, he begins these, this first part, you know, talking about Judah. Judah, you're going in the same direction as Israel. Your sister, in a sense, we'll see later on, he talks about his sister Israel. You're going in the, in the same way and same direction. And the things that are going to be happening soon in, in, in Israel are going to be happening soon after to you if you don't get your act straight. But you're following in the same example in the wickedness of Israel. So we begin verse 2. Hear, O heavens, give, earth, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. And talk about Israel and Judah. I brought them up. I nursed them, and re they rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner. The donkey knows its master. The ox behaves. The, the, the donkey behaves. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. So there. So as we're looking at this in the context of uh, current events in, in Israel, what's happening and everything that's going on, Isaiah is saying that, you know, look at what's happening around you. Look at what's hap what happening in Israel. Look what they're doing. Look how they don't follow God. Don't follow in their uh, steps. 
that sinful nation, verse four, uh, laden with iniquity, brought, brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. And that's one, one of the things we see in the relationship between Israel and Judah. At the beginning, there was civil war between them. They fought between them, but then uh, they became friends. And when they became friends, you know, they married between each other. And then the sin kind of from Israel came over to Judah and Judah followed in the steps of Israel. They are the ones that are corruptors, corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked him to anger, the Holy One of Israel, and have turned their backs. So, and and they're, they're going to be destroyed. They're, they're, they're it's talking about destruction that is coming against them. You know, verse seven, your country will is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land and your presence is desolate, overthrown by strangers. And uh, so the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, the hut in a garden of cucumbers as a besieged city. So the consequences of Israel also are having consequences of Judah. So even though Judah will not be destroyed during this Assyrian invasion, God will save them. And we looked a little bit of that in the life of Hezekiah. Um, they're going to be besieged. They're going to go through warfare, difficult times. And we see verse 9, that unless the Lord of hosts had left us with a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been, been made like Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah. There we go back to the allusion towards Genesis, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis, and see that connection there. Um, you know, the, the fall, uh, this is what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. They left the Lord. The Lord had to bring destruction on them, and you're going in the same direction. So it says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of your God, people of Gomorrah. Um, what is the purpose of this multitude of sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams, of fat, of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. Um, you know, you're, you're sacrificing, but it means nothing because you're sacrificing to false God. Remember the, the calves, uh, the worship there in Israel. Um, you know, all these things you're doing. Uh, basically, if we look down to verse 15, it says, when you spread out your hands, when you like raise your hands to me, I hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Your hands are full of blood. And that is what we see the consequence. Their hands were bloody because they were trying to sacrifice for God, but there are many sins and the things they were doing. Uh, God says, you know, wash yourselves, make yourself clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the, re rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. These are things I ask you to do, things we saw in Hosea. You know, these are the things he's looking, They're, the pe people are being oppressed. Uh, stop doing that, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the father, just plead for the widow. And then we see verses like this one. They're like, oh, I know that one. I've heard that one before. And Isaiah is full of them. Verses that we see on, uh, that we people quote, people memorize, verses that we'll see on maybe pictures in the wall. These are famous verses that uh, maybe we don't know where they came from. Now we're going to see that we know. And here's one, verse 18, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat from the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." I'm, I'm in reason, make sense. Look at what you're doing. Look at how you're living. Let, let's, let, let's, let's have this make sense. You know, I will forgive you. I'm going to bring that redeemer. I'm going to bring the redeemer that's going to restore you and cleanse you so you're white as snow. Even though your, your, your sins are red like crimson, scarlet, I will come and wash you. I will come and, and clean you if you are willing, there's willing and obedient. Uh, you're going to eat the fruit of the land. But if you refuse, not willing, and rebel, not obedient, then you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there we see God saying, choose life, death, you know, willing and obedient, uh, refuse and rebel. Each one has its consequence. I will cleanse you. Uh, you, you will be made, made clean or the sword, uh, devoured by the sword. And unfortunately, we go through that he's always offering, always offering redemption. But it seems like the people are not listening. 
uh, as we go through each prophet, we'll see there are some that listen to Isaiah. There's people that follow. But as we get things get worse and worse, we'll get to an, a prophet like Jeremiah where nobody listened to him. Nobody. And he was like the, the crying prophet. You're always crying. You're always saying that, but nobody would listen. So uh, there are some people that the, the Lord says, come, let us reason together. And they'll kind of listen. Because we see during Isaiah, he, he preaches during, during Hez, the time like Hezekiah, a good king. Uh, he wasn't always perfect, but he was a good king. So uh, we see him, you know, speaking uh, during this time and people responding during this time. So there are some times when Isaiah has uh, people who are responding to his prophecies, but many times the people themselves, their hearts were rebellious. Uh, they were, you know, as we see in verse 21, how the faithful city has become a harlot. Uh, they've given themselves over to evil, to the you know foreign gods, foreign ways, and basically now have uh, been oppressive to the people. Uh, and you know we'll see all the things that we see going on. So the Lord says, you know, verse twenty-four, uh, Lord of hosts, mighty one of Israel, I will rid myself of my adversaries. I will take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you, and thoroughly purge away your dross. And take away your alloy and restore your judges as of first and your counselors as of the beginning. And afterward, you will be called city of righteousness, the faithful city. So I'm going to come and purify. I'm going to take away the dross. Basically, that's the, the impurities when you when you put silver in, in, and melt it. The dross is what comes up or the, those impurities. I'm going to take those away. I'm going to purify you. I'm going to be as the beginning. And you once again, you will be called the righteous faithful city. And that's Isaiah is always looking toward the future, always looking towards the future. This is, um, I, I, this is where you're at now. You're, you know, you're not doing so well. You're following bad examples. But in the future, I'm going to bring my redeemer. I'm going to bring the one who's going to restore. And I'm going to make you a righteous city. I'm going to give you a, a new heart. And other things that we look ahead, uh, he's going to change and transform because he promises that this redeemer, this Messiah will come. Um, Chapter two, going to the next chapter, the word of Isaiah, son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So we're seeing now we go from Israel now to Judah. Uh, and, you know, Judah, be aware that we're talking about Israel. Israel is going to be judged, but you are not far behind. Uh, it shall come to pass in the latter days, not now, but later on, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and she'll be exalted above the hills and the nations shall flow to it. In the future, this city will be a hub. Everybody will go there. Many people will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the, house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk his paths. Uh, we, I use this a lot. You know, when we do tours to Israel, this is actually the verse saying, you know, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Let's go to Israel. Let us go to Jerusalem. Let us see the Lord. Let us walk with him uh, in his ways. And so, you know, let us go there as, as the Lord purifies, as the Lord does his job to restore. Um, in the future, in the latter days, he will judge between nations. He will rebuke many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore the day of the Lord. Um, so we see today, right now, Israel, not the day of the Lord. Uh, they're at war, there are missiles going back and forth. It is still that center of contention. Uh, the Lord did promise bring back his people, but we see that he is he's still working he's still doing that the the prophecy in a sense of the restoration of israel has not been completed yet there's still hardened hearts on both sides uh there's still the, the the judgment and war and and between peoples and we need to pray that the lord would bring peace to israel uh, a lasting peace a, a peace that uh is more than just a national or a um, kind of a brokered peace or a peace that is uh, a human peace. We want him to bring the peace where they beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And that's the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. We're seeking that, uh, that we can um, see that day um, when the Lord will do that. Um, We'll see that when that does, when the Lord reigns, uh, verse 7, their land will be full uh, of uh, silver and gold. There shall be no end to their treasuries. The land is full of horses. 
there's no need, uh, no end to their chariots. For, um, the land is also full of idols. Well, they worshiped the work of their own hands that which their own fingers have made. People bow down, each man humbles himself, therefore do not forgive them. So this is the time you've you know, been forsaken. Uh, you, you, you're called to walk in the light of the Lord, verse five, but then they've forsaken the Lord. Um, they've, uh, they've sought their riches, they've sought the, their, uh, their idols, um, and the Lord will, once again, we're looking back at the Lord will bring uh, judgment. Um, the terror of the Lord was coming, verse 10. Um, the day of the Lord of hosts, verse 12, shall come upon everything proud and lofty. Upon everything lifted up, it shall be brought low. Upon the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, upon the oaks of Bashan, upon the high mountains, everything, and upon the hills that are lifted up, every high tower, everything. Uh, all the loftiness of man, verse 17, shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. Um, the Lord alone will be exalted that day and the idols he will abolish. So once again, we're looking today when the Lord brings judgment, he will abolish those idols. Um, when his majesty comes uh, against them in that day, man will cast away his idols of silver, his idols of gold, gold, which he, they made each for himself to worship to moles and bats and will hide from the terror. These idols are not <laughs> powerful. Uh, because the Lord of hosts, the Lord is his name, is shaking the earth. Uh, and uh, it, we see mixed in, okay, there's judgment coming because there's idol, idolatry, there's sin, there's oppression. And there's a day coming when the Lord will judge. There's a day coming when the Lord will reign and rule and will send uh, his son, uh, Emmanuel, God with us, to come and reign and rule. Uh, we go on to chapter 3. Uh, for behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the supply of water, the mighty man and man of war and judge and prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counselor and skillful artisan, the expert enchanter. I will give their children to their princes and babes shall rule over them. I'm going to take them away. And we're looking you know, later on there. Actually, uh, we have three times that Nebuchadnezzar comes in and takes captives. And the first time he takes all the princes, all the, the, the main you know, important people, he takes them away. And then he comes and takes the second time all the artisans uh, and everybody who's got some kind of, some kind of worthy um, uh, job or something and takes them. And then the third time he comes and takes everybody away, basically just the poor of the land, just a few stragglers are left. And as he goes, he takes the king away and leaves uh, like one of the kids, one of the sons in charge to be uh, the king. Um, it is those days, you know, the, the Lord is coming to judge. Uh, the Lord is coming to judge. Uh, verse 8, Jerusalem stumbled. Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. Why did they fall? Why did they stumble? Because they were going against the Lord. Um, they were following the, in, the, in the ways of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, they brought, we see verse 9, they have brought evil upon themselves. They have brought this evil upon themselves uh, because they have, you know, continued in their ways, uh, not followed the Lord, oppressed others. And the Lord has to judge. Verse 14, the Lord enters into judgment with the elders of the people as princes. Why? You've eaten up the vineyard. They plundered the poor in their houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord of hosts? Uh, you're haughty. You walk with outstretched necks, wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, jingling their feet. This is this is like last one. We saw the cows of Bashan in Hosea. Uh, you you're, have all these riches and you're oppressing the poor. And uh, that is why judgment is coming. Verse 18, in that day, the Lord will take away their finery, their jingling anklets, their scarves and their crescents. He will take it all away. And instead of, verse 24, instead of sweet smell, there will be stench. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of a well-set hair, baldness. Instead of a rich robe, a girding of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. For men shall fall by the sword as your mighty in the war. Her gates shall lament and mourn. And she shall be, she being desolate, shall sit on the ground. This is what's coming because of their sin. Uh, because of their, their oppression of the poor and 
Uh, and it said in those days, you know, verse one, and it kind of is a continuation of chapter three, uh, this verse one of chapter four. In those days, seven women would take hold of one man saying, we will eat our own food, wear our own apparel, let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach, basically saying, you know, marry us, yeah, take away our reproach. Uh, we don't want to be widows anymore. Uh, well, we won't, we won't go shopping. You know, we, we'll eat our own food. We don't have to feed us, you know, just, just take away our reproach. And it's like the desperation we see there. Um, and the Lord says, that is the time Well, I will renew I will renew my people. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. And talks about this branch that's going to grow, this, this, this new growth that will happen. It will be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. And it shall come to pass that he was left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, when this washing comes and the filth is washed away and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and her, above her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of flaming fire by night. For over the glory shall be a covering, and there will be a tabernacle for the shade in the daytime of the heat, a place of refuge and for a shelter from the storm and rain. And we see kind of like when they were led through um, uh, the desert, you know, they had this, this at the night there was a flaming fire, and during the day there was a cloud that led them. Uh, we'll see that, that refuge. We move to Isaiah chapter five, and we see one, one of the times very poetic, uh, goes from more of a prophecy to more of a poet, a uh, poem. And this is actually a song, sing to my well-beloved, a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. So the theme now, you know, Isaiah has many times that he gives visual pictures, you know, visual pictures of, of what uh, the Lord is doing, how the Lord is working. And here we see one of the main pictures when it's described, the, the children of Israel, Judah, uh, children of Israel, is described as God's vineyard. And uh, it says, my beloved, my well-beloved has a vineyard. And we can think back to, to, um, to Solomon and the Song of Solomon and the vineyard and um, on a very fruitful hill, he dug it. He cleared out its stones. He planted it with the choicest vines. He built a tower in its midst and he made a wine press. And so he expected to bring good grapes. And, but it brought forth wild grapes, bad grapes. Yeah. And uh, so the question is, and this is a question is, okay, so inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah, judge, okay, what should we do with this vineyard? What more could have been done? Uh, we did it. We looked at choicest vines. We cleared out the stones. We put a protection around it. We made a wine press. Everything was done. What more could have been done? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And the question, so what should I do? And I'll tell you what I'm going to do, he says. I'm going to take away the hedge. I'm going to burn everything down. I'm going to break down the wall. It will be trampled down. I'm going to lay it waste. It will not be pruned or dug. Uh, there will come up briars and thorns and command the clouds that will not rain upon it. And he says, this is what I mean. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. This is the judgment that is coming first on Israel. Very soon, Assyria is coming, but then also Judah. Um, he looked for justice. <laughs> but behold, what did he find? Oppression. He looked for righteousness, but what did he find? A cry for help. And, you know, this is the judgment that the Lord is going to bring. Whoa. And we'll see a lot of whoa. Uh, you know, look at this. Uh, you know, pay attention. Um, this is what's going to happen. Uh, verse 13, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And this is one of the things that as we look at this over and over, a knowledge of the Lord is so important. Knowing God's word, knowing what it says is so important. Knowing uh, his, the way he works and what he does because the Lord doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, the same heart of, of judgment, you know, uh, of having to judge sin is there, but also the heart of love that wants to restore and is calling out and, and giving opportunities and chances come back to me is there also. 
Uh, my people have gone into captivity because they had no knowledge. And God wants us to know him. God reveals himself to us so that we can know him. But many times we're just too distracted with everything else. We don't want to get to know God, which is our main purpose and call to get to know him and to live for him. And because of that, well, honorable men are famished. Uh, multitude is dried up with thirst. They're hungry. They're thirsty because they're not seeking the true nourishment from uh, the Lord. Sheol, uh, death has enlarged itself and opened his mouth beyond measure. Uh, death is eating them up. The glory and their multitude and their pomp and he who is jubilant, jubilant shall descend into it. Everybody will be brought down. Each man will be humbled and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. Uh, Lord brings judgment because they did not understand. They did not know. They did not want to know the ways of the Lord. Um, one of the things that we reason we go through and, you know, looking at these key points in the Bible is many times we, we, we kind of may have a fear of reading and knowing the Bible. It's like, I, I'm going to get lost. I want to understand. And one of the reasons we're going through is just kind of, we're in a very general way. We're going through, walking through a book like Isaiah, uh, who has a lot of things that can be a little confusing, but as we get to an idea and go through and see what the message is and see how the Lord is working, we can see, first of all, apply it to our lives and say, you know, He's warning Judah because of the example of his sister Israel, and they're not listening. What about me? I'm listening to this. Am I listening to what it's saying? Am I applying it to my life and then seeing how it's speaking to me? I'm looking at the situation around me. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things going on, uh, a lot of bad things, a lot of troubled times. So what does that mean? Is the Lord judging? Is the Lord going to come back? Are some of the prophecies we see here, are they going to come to place? And we need to be asking ourselves and, and realize uh, because of our lack of knowledge, we could be captured. We could be put in captivity and I mean, not taken away as slaves, but captivity to things, captivity to addictions, captivity to things of this world um, because we have no knowledge. So let us seek to know him uh, and to know uh, the Lord more so we can know uh, who he is and how he works and uh, that he is the one who is going to judge, uh, bring this judgment. And I like this part because we see the first five chapters of Isaiah. And Isaiah is, in a sense, judging the people. He is being in a, uh, maybe not harsh, but he's just bringing the judgment down on the people. But as he's doing that, the Lord kind of stops. And we see in chapter six, something happens. In chapter six, one of my favorite chapters in the book of Isaiah, we see that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his faith, face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So, so Isaiah is here uh, in the midst of him bringing judgment on, on the people and you're going to be judged and this is what you're going to do and, and you and you and you. The Lord kind of stops that and gives him a vision of himself. Gives him a vision in the temple. I saw the Lord in the temple high and lifted up. I saw the angels uh, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then the greatness, everything was shaken. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. I could not stand in his presence. And when I saw him, I realized <laughs> I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And this is what Isaiah, what happened to the heart of Isaiah. Isaiah had spent the last five chapters saying, you guys are all doing bad. You guys are. But then when he, when he, when he had this vision of God and, and they were in a sense to compare himself to God, he realized I'm just like them. I'm just like them. I am a man of unclean lips. And I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I'm the first one. And I'm not worthy to be before this God, I'm not worthy to be before him. And he fell like a dead man. 
But you see, the Lord wasn't done with him. The Lord wanted him to come to that recognition. The Lord wanted him to realize uh, what was going on and what was happening and, and his condition. So, so the Lord uh, comes before him and says, um, sends an angel. So one of the seraphim flew to him and having his hand a live coal, he'd taken the tongues from the altar. He touched the, the mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who shall go up for us? And I said, here am I, send me. You see, first of all, Isaiah had to be uh, cleansed. There's this, this fire uh, from the altar touched his lips cleansed him from his sins, forgave him. And with that forgiveness, he was ready to once again hear the voice of the Lord, but now hear in a different way. He heard the voice of the Lord and he knew, it's not about me. I'm just like them. And I'm, I'm here to take a message from the Lord. Who will go? Who will go? Uh, and he raises his hands here. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Now I'm ready to go and be the prophet that you can use. So the Lord says, go tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy. They shut their eyes, lest they see with their ears, hear with their, uh, see with their eyes, hear with, hear with their ears. That would be interesting. And understand what, with their hearts and return and be healed. Um, you know, they're, they're stubborn and maybe just increase in that stubbornness. And I say, it goes, how long? How long must I have been saying this message is until the cities are laid waste without inhabitants, until the house are des desolate. Basically, Isaiah, you're going to be preaching this, but you, they're not going to listen to you. They're, not, they're, they're so stuck in their sins, they're not going to listen to you. But go. Go take the message anyway, because the Lord is merciful. He wants to bring this message to them so that they will, uh, some may listen and turn to the Lord. Uh, another thing about Isaiah we have here in Isaiah 7, we, it kind of goes from prophecy to kind of little, you know, history. This is what happened, kind of an event. So we have that in chapter 7, in the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, um, uh, son of Uzziah. This is after Uzziah dies. Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remali, king of Israel, went up to Israel to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. So there's a war. This is before Israel is destroyed. It's, it's kind of on, on the way. If we look at Rezin, Rezin well, Pekah, let's look at Pekah. I uh, want to see here, uh, Pekah, king of Israel. So here is the next to last king. So during this time of Isaiah, uh, we see uh, Rezin and Pekah come against uh, Israel. Uh, so they're, they're fighting Israel. And... Um, they, uh, Israel's all worried. Oh, they're invading. Now we have two countries coming against us. What are we going to do? And he goes to uh, Ahaz, the king, and says, don't worry. Take heed, be quiet. Do not fear, be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands, the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramaliah. Don't worry about them. Um, I will, you know, bring the victory. Um they, they said, let us go against Judah and trouble it. Let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set kings over them. Uh, thus says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. It shall not stand. It will not come to pass. The head of Syria is Damascus. The head of Damascus is resin. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken so that a people will not be a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. The head of Samaria is Ramaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you will not be established. This will not happen. Uh, you uh, this will, you will be, um, they will be destroyed. And he gives them a sign. I'm going to give you a sign of well, this is what, uh, that this will come to pass. And the Lord spoke to Ahaz saying, a sign for yourself from the Lord, your God, ask it either in the depths or the heights above. Uh, and he says, no, I'm not going to test the Lord. He still feared the Lord, but he says here, O house of David, it's a small thing for you to weary men, but you, will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. This will be the sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For behold, the child shall know to refuse evil and choose good. The land you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people will and your father's house days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. Um, there's a sign coming. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, call his name Emmanuel. And we're like, well, that's, oh, this isn't the sign of Jesus. You know, that's what we said, God with us. 
uh, curds and honey shall you eat and, and refuse to, uh, and he said, before this child knows uh, what is happening, uh, you know, the Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and the people, uh, uh, the people that were bothering you basically will be destroyed. Uh, Ephraim will be destroyed. Syria will be destroyed. Um, and we ask ourselves, well, okay, this is a sign to Jesus. And one of the things we see many times, we see uh, shadow prophecies, in a sense, prophecies that are fulfilled in, in a certain way, but they have a greater fulfillment later on uh, in, in this kind of a shadow of the true fulfillment, which is, of course, Jesus coming and the virgin conceiving and bearing a son and calling his name uh, Emmanuel. Um, we, we need to see and believe, well, somehow this came to pass. We don't have a historical accurate thing of this. We have it when Jesus was born. But somehow, well, I don't know, was she a virgin? What happened? We don't know the story, but the Lord says when this, when this happens during this time, before uh, he can start walking, basically Israel will be destroyed. It won't be a problem anymore. But we see also this is a sign of the, the true redemption, the true restoration of Israel is when the virgin, Mary, will bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And we'll see a little bit more about him in the next chapters. Um, in those days, the Lord uh, will whistle for the fly um, that is from the farthest parts of the river of Egypt, a bee that is in the land of Assyria. They will come and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys, in the cleft of the rocks and all the thorns and pastures. In the same day, the Lord will shave, out, shave with a hired razor those who are beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the heads and the hair of the legs, and he will remove the beard. Basically, he's going to bring Assyria down and, and do, do away with. Uh, these men that are coming against Judah um, and bring that destruction. Um, the Lord is going to do this. And as we continue with this, we'll look at chapter eight. We have another visual here. The Lord said to me, take a large scroll, write on it with a man's pen, a man's pen. I wonder what a man's pen looks like. Well, uh, a man's pen concerning Maher Shalah Hashbaz. Wow. Another one of those names that you might want to consider not naming your kids. Uh, it said, I will take for myself faithful witness to record or Uriah the priest and Zechariah, son of Jerbereshiah. Uh, so I went to the prophetess. That's his wife. His wife is the prophetess. And actually, they were both prophets. And she conceived and bore a son. And just like we saw in Hosea, the sons were given special names. So the son was called Maher Shalom Hashbaz. And like, what does that name mean? It means speed the spoil, hasten the booty. So if you want to name your son speed the spoil and hasten the booty, you can name him Maher Shal Hashbaz. But basically, this is going to come quickly. It says, because for before the Lord, shall, the child has, shall have knowledge to cry my father and my mother. Before he says, Mama, Papa. Uh, the riches of Damascus and the spoils of Samaria will be taken away by the king of Assyria. So this is by the child, time the child can speak, this problem will be over. So political problem happening at that time. This is a sign they said, you know, when this child is born, um, that is it. Uh, you know, it will be no longer be a problem. Um, because these people refuse. The waters of Shiloh, the flow softly, they, and rejoice in Resin and Ramaliah's son. The Israel has refused to serve me, and now they're going after Syria. Well, now um, they will be destroyed. The king of Assyria and all his glory, he will go up over the channels and go over the banks. He will pass through Judah and he will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck, and the stretching of his wings uh, will fill the breath of your hands, O Emmanuel. You're shattered. Shattered, O peoples, broken in pieces. Give ear, all you from far countries. Gird yourselves, be, but be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. You're going to be destroyed. Uh, this destruction is coming. Um, you will, this will come upon you because you have followed this, uh, the people of, of uh, Syria. You've followed the enemies of God instead of following God. Um, Chapter ends, verse 19, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter. Should not a people seek their God? Should not they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law, to the testimony, if they did not speak according to the word, is it because there is no light in them? He said, all the people you're looking for, these wizards and mediums, and instead of going to God and asking, shouldn't you, shouldn't God's people seek God? 
uh, and no. So what will happen? They will pass through it hard pressed and hungry it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upwards. And they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness and gloom and will be driven into darkness. And from this darkness, what will happen? I love this verse chapter nine. Nevertheless, this gloom will, will not be upon her who is distressed. Um, you know, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali afterward, more heavily oppressed by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan and Galilee of the Gentiles. And here it is, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. From where? From Galilee of the Gentiles. Who comes from Galilee? We see Jesus. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest as a man rejoices when they divide the spoil. They have broken the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of the oppressor in the days of Midian. Um, why? Well, verse six, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, and Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his governor and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. The Lord will reign. The Lord will reign and send his son who will be wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, uh, will be sent to bring this light. Um, and I, I love it. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. He will come, the child that is promised, the Messiah will come and uh, he will come to rule and to reign. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful part as we look at what is going to happen here uh, in the coming of the Emmanuel, the coming of the Messiah. We move on to chapter 10. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortunes, which they have prescribed to rob the needy of justice. Once again, you guys who are, who are leading people astray, woe to you. Uh, you will, what will you do, verse 3, in the day of punishment and then desolation, which comes from afar? What are you going to do? You are saying peace and everything's fine. We're going to win. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you will, <laughs> what are you going to do? The Lord. <laughs> Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. You know, Assyria is that rod that Lord, your Lord used for Israel and for uh, Syria. Um, but you too, uh, if you continue in your ways, you know, you will also be destroyed. Um, and, and we see actually when, we, uh, when they come against Judah uh, during Hezekiah's time, he destroys, you know, he just destroys, utterly destroys the army that comes against Jerusalem to protect Hezekiah. Uh, because they um, they were not supposed to, you know, the Lord was going to save Hezekiah from them. Um, verse 12, therefore it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed his work on Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of their arrogant hearts of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. So eventually, you know, Assyria is punished. Just like later on when Babylon is brought here to be the rod of the Lord's anger against Judah, Babylon itself is punished for uh, what it did to Israel. Um, and we see the Lord's judgment because he wants to bring a remnant. He wants to refine and restore after judgment comes. If we look there at verse 20, it says, it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such who have escaped the house of Jacob will never depend, again, depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness, for the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of the land. I will restore that remnant. I will restore that remnant. And one of the things we see now, and, and a lot of people talk about, oh, in Israel, and they were pro-Israel or not pro-Israel, but we see the Lord has returned them to them as a nation. This, uh, what other nation do we hear that was, you know, in a sense, destroyed as a nation so many years ago and then got remade? Uh, the Jews were wandering around the world uh, like the sand of the sea we see here. And the Lord brought them back, uh, brought them back um, 
to the nation, to the land, and has restored the nation. He's still working on their hearts in many ways. Uh, there's, there's a remnant there that's coming to the Lord, and people are coming and learning and who the Messiah is and seeing Jesus. But there's still a lot of restoration of heart that needs to be done. But we see that the nation has been restored. And, you, and when that happens, we see that, that Jerusalem becomes that, that um, the rock against the nations, you know, crush themselves against and becomes that chalice, you know, of, of, of contention uh, and like it is right now. But the Lord says, in the end, I will restore, uh, I will bring them back and I will make an end in the land. I will finish this. And that's looking for us towards the future still, but we're part of the prophecies that we'll see uh, here. Um, verse 27, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder, the yoke from your neck, your yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. He has come to Aeth, has passed Migron, and Michmash has attended his equipment. They have gone along the ridge. They have taken lodging in Geba. Ramah is afraid. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Oh, lift up your voice, her daughter of Galim. Cause it to be heard as far as Laish. Poor Anathos. Madman has fled. The inhabitants of Gibeah seek refuge. And Yehu will remain of Nob that day. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down. The haughty will be humbled. He will cut the thickest forests with iron and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one, mighty one. The Lord will bring his rule and he will bring restore, restoration. And we'll see there in chapter 11, then shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out from his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Like Psalm 2 says, he will rule with a rod of iron. The messianic Psalm talking about Jesus ruling and reigning. And we see this rod from the stem of Jesse, uh, the son of David, um, he will come to rule and to reign. And when it talks about him, it says, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, faithfulness, the belt of his weight. And we see kind of a prophecy of the future. This is the future messianic kingdom. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf, the lion shall be, and the fatling together, and the children shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. The young one shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And I love that. that that's what we're looking for, that the, 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 the earth would be full of the knowledge of God. Remember, for a lack of knowledge, they were led, led captive. And, and our goal is that one day the world will have that full knowledge of him and will know him. And in those days, you know, the peace of the Lord will rule. And we see, you know, the cobra with the child, the snake and the viper and the bear. And it's like peace restored to what we see in Genesis when we had, you know, uh, all the animals and everything there, but there was no, you know, death or dying. Uh, being together without, you know, uh, predator and prey and, and fighting and, and kill or be killed. No, uh, a day of peace where creation itself will once again be at peace. And we look forward to that day and the day of the Lord and the Lord to do that. So Isaiah ends here with chapter 12, singing a hymn of praise. And it shall be in that day, you will say, oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away. Your comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yahweh, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day, you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his deed among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Twelve chapters, very quick. But what we see is the Lord has a plan. The Lord has to judge. 
He is he 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 loves us so much that he's sending his son to die for us on the cross to pay for our sins to be that that anointed one the Emmanuel God with us uh, the child that is born the wonderful counselor mighty God Prince of Peace to rule the nations but first he's going to to pay with his life pay the price to restore that relationship to wash us in the water of the blood though our sins be like scarlet he will wash us white as snow. And he will restore the reign of God, bring peace to this to creation. A lion will lie down with the lamb. But before all that comes to pass, the Lord must also judge. He is a God of judgment and he must judge sin. And he's warning. If you keep going in this way, like your sister Israel, like Judah, like what we read, there are consequences. My judgment will come. I will judge. I will bring judgment. What are you going to do? Who are you going to serve? Idols, you know, everybody else, the way of the world, the way of the foreign nations, or serve me. We see his love. We see his promise. We see his sending of the Messiah, Emmanuel, God coming to dwell with us, revealing himself to us so that we can know them, so that the knowledge, I love this, that the knowledge of the Lord, uh, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. That is the goal, that the earth would know and that everybody would know him and truly know, know God. And you and I have been given a, a part of that to share the gospel, share the good news of the world, of the, of the Lord to others so that the knowledge of him will cover the earth and then his kingdom will come. Amen. Well, I keep praying for you that you would seek the Lord, that you would seek his face and that you would share with others the knowledge of him and follow his ways. He is a God of love who, even though he has to judge this earth, will is setting away a path so that we can know Jesus and follow him and be led in his ways. May the Lord bless you and keep you today. Amen.